and also to our photographer, Roy Basil. There's some great shots in the last edition with everyone masked. It's great. So it'll be, it'll be a time, a record time for us to look back on. So also I've been sharing for several weeks that our youth ed team has been planning an online option for kids. I'm happy to announce that yesterday we met to do our first taping. One of our teachers, Cindy Gibbs, created and taught an interactive session accompanied by activities that kids can do at home. So our videographer, producer, and director, Kathy Boyd, will work on the editing, and we will let you know as soon as it's available. If you have children, grandchildren, or other significant kids in your life, please access it, and we will, as I said, we'll let you know. It'll be a private link on a YouTube channel. And we plan to uh, publish one every two weeks, so I'll get that link out as soon as we have it ready. Also, mark your calendars if you have not already done so for the 40th Women's Interfaith Conference to be held by, on Zoom this year on April 8th from 10 to noon. And the theme is Women of Faith Beyond Stereotypes to Truth. That should be a great theme. Registration is free this year. Donations are gratefully accepted. And by the way, everyone is most welcome to attend. As soon as the actual registration form is available, I'll make sure everybody gets it. One more reminder, and that is we are ordering Easter lilies this year. They will be $8 and can be purchased in honor or memory of a loved one. Just send a check through the mail and designate what it's for or call Sarah at First Unity. The deadline for the orders is March 21st. Now, I have a very special announcement, and that is that our very own LUT and RUP has applied to the field ministry program. She has already taken her long written test and she is on her way. She has been invited for entrance interviews in a couple weeks. And that is the first stage of the process and we affirm that she is going to go through it beautifully and gracefully. It is a process, it is a process. But this is wonderful news, not only for Anne, but it's going to be really amazing for our church to support another minister. And I am sure that our entire spiritual community will be enriched by everything Anne learns. I've been through the program, and it is just amazing. So congratulations, Anne. We just we know you're on your way. And the board and all the prayer chaplains have been so honored to support her, as am I. I know that she will feel your good thoughts and prayers throughout the process. And as our speaker today, and her message is entitled, Larger Than Life. So at this time, I would like to invite Lynn Mark, and thank you for being here with us today, to read the Daily Word and to lead us in prayer. Lynn? Good morning. It is my great honor to be your daily prayer chaplain today, March 7th, 2021. Today's word is actually two words. It is world peace. Celebrating diversity and affirming unity, I am a presence of peace in the world. The road to world peace begins with my open-hearted acceptance of those who are different than me. Our world is vast and diverse, and its people come from a wide variety of cultures and histories. The more I learn about those whose lives differ from mine, the more I can appreciate their perspectives and empathize with their struggles. When I make the decision to understand others, I discover that judgment fades in the light of compassion. Today, I sow peace through my acceptance and understanding. Peace in the world grows as I join my brothers and sisters in celebrating the glory of human diversity and affirming oneness with God. And from Isaiah 2, verse 4, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Would you pray with me for a minute? Precious Spirit, Today, our prayer is for world peace, for peace on our planet Earth. But we are reminded that there is a divine order of peace throughout the universe. We pray, precious spirit, that we may start by finding our own inner source of love and kinship. We pray that our thoughts and our actions 
come from this place of deep acceptance. And we pray that we may reflect God's will for peace as we encounter all manner of other creatures. And so it is. Amen. This is a personally special lesson for me today. As Reverend Jan announced a few minutes ago, I've been invited to interview for Unity's field ministerial program. To be invited into the program, a candidate must complete an assessment test, a background check, and even a psychological evaluation. Then, they're vetted through an extensive interview process by several teams. The lesson I'm sharing with you today was created to be used during that interview process the weeks of March 15th and March 22nd. Since historically, they don't want candidates to use props for their lesson, there won't be any slides today. Over the past year, events have happened that have seemed to be beyond our comprehension at times, or possibly appear to be disastrous. In order to try to understand them, I've spent time contemplating their impact through different lenses focused on the individual, families, our country, and the world. This is a rare time in humanity's history when events have impacted us globally on many levels. All of us have been asked to do things that we really don't want to do or understand completely. And it seems our resistance to any more changes seems to be at a snapping point. While contemplating the deep impact of these events, what came to mind for me was the story of the prophet Jonah. You most likely know the popular children's story about Jonah and the big fish. Today, we're going to look at this story in the light of Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore's Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. The word Jonah means a dove or dove-like. It also means warmth, affection, lovable, fruitful, productive, fertile, effervescent, passionate, oppressive, violent, intoxicating, destructive. This covers the gamut of human nature, doesn't it? Maybe you noticed how the types of words used to describe Jonah change after the word effervescent. They took on a somewhat darker tone. Effervescent means vivacious or enthusiastic. I don't know about you, but when I get excited and enthusiastic about something, I've learned that this is my cue to put myself in timeout. When I'm excited or enthusiastic, this is not the time to be making decisions and acting on them. I need time to settle down and weigh things with other abilities or powers, such as wisdom, understanding, order, and love. If I allow myself to act from excitement or enthusiasm alone, I've learned that things can turn out disastrously. Further, in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, it says that Jonah symbolizes a prophetic state of mind, which, if used without divine love, fixes man in bondage to a belief in a law of cause and effect, where error sowing 
cannot be redeemed or forgiven. In this sense, we are each a prophet to some degree. The prophets of the Old Testament all represent different attitudes, motives, states of mind, and degrees of understanding, which attempt to speak words of truth. And Jonah stands for a very wide variety of all of this in one person. He's a very mixed symbology, as most of us are. The average person, represented by Jonah, usually follows the whole gamut of mind attitudes represented by Jonah's name. Jonah is a conglomerate symbol. He stands for the wide possibility of different motives, attitudes, and states of mind, some contradictory, that we can be in as we attempt to comprehend and express the truth we know, particularly in personally challenging times. Some of these efforts on our part result in harmony and satisfaction. Jonah, too, had a great deal <clears throat> of success and usefulness, but he also experienced some results in turmoil and distress. Can you relate? The story of Jonah and the whale, one of the oddest accounts in the Bible, opens with God speaking to Jonah, commanding him to preach repentance to the city of Nineveh. Jonah found God's order unbearable. He was experiencing success where he was, prophesying to the Israelites and very comfortable. Not only was Nineveh known for its wickedness, but it was also the capital of the Assyrian Empire, one of Israel's fiercest enemies. Jonah, a stubborn fellow, did just the opposite of what he was asked to do. He went down to the seaport of Joppa and booked passage on a ship to Tarshish, heading directly away from Nineveh to the other side of the known world at that time. In response, God sent a violent storm which threatened to break the ship to pieces. The terrified crew cast lots, determining that Jonah was responsible for the storm. Jonah told them to throw him overboard. But first, the crew tried rowing to shore, but then the waves got even higher. Afraid of God, the sailors finally tossed Jonah into the sea, and the water immediately became calm. Jonah's being tossed into the stormy sea represents a disastrous state of affairs, and we all get ourselves into these by various attitudes or states of consciousness which are not in conformity to the principles we know. And this usually occurs when we duplicate what Jonah attempts to do in the book, to ignore the truth we already know or to try to use our knowledge for negative purposes. When this happens, we can become fault-finding and rebellious against divine law. And this seems to be what Jonah did. So his troubles begin. Now, the most famous incident in the book occurs. Instead of drowning, Jonah is swallowed by a big fish. Fish are a metaphysical symbol for ideas. This particular fish was a big fish and was sent by God. Therefore, it represents a big divine idea. This fish did not come to harm Jonah or kill him. It actually came to rescue him. 
after the sailors granted Jonah's request to cast him into the sea. So we can say that Jonah's being tossed into the stormy sea symbolizes falling into a disastrous state of affairs, but as unity teaches, God is our help in every need. And much of the time, the help that God provides comes in the form of any needed divine idea. This is the meaning of the great fish prepared by God to rescue Jonah. Metaphysically, this illustrates the fact that no matter how complicated or hopeless looking a situation we may find ourselves in, God will provide the right kind of help when we're willing to receive it. Most often, the right divine idea will be revealed to us. It will be a truth idea into which we can immerse all our attention, belief, and faith if we choose to do so. And we can let this idea absorb our attention until it becomes larger than life. This is the deeper meaning of being swallowed by a great fish. And when Jonah was swallowed by the fish, he repented and cried out to God in prayer. He praised God, ending with the prophetic statement, salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah was inside the great fish for three days. We can perceive this as indicating it can take a while for us to absorb a divine idea. When Jonah was ready, then God commanded the fish and it vomited the reluctant prophet onto dry land. A completely new opportunity was presented to Jonah. We can interpret this at different levels. For example, for the whole human race on this evolutionary life wave or individually when we go through personally disastrous experiences. And this time, Jonah obeyed God. He walked through Nineveh, proclaiming that in 40 days the city would be destroyed. Surprisingly, the Ninevites believed Jonah's message and repented, wearing sackcloth and covering themselves in ashes. Bible scholars believe that the Ninevites may have easily repented because of the way Jonah may have looked. After spending three days in the belly of the fish, his hair and skin would probably have been bleached white, which would have created quite a ghostly spectacle. The story goes on to say that God had compassion on the Ninevites and did not destroy them. Well, guess what? Again, Jonah questions God because he's angry that Israel's enemies had been spared. Instead of holding on to the divine idea of God's redemptive love that he discovered in the belly of the fish, he slips back into a negative state of mind. He's so angry and disappointed that he asks Jehovah to take his life from him. But God asks him, what good does it do you to be angry? God gives Jonah yet another chance to reflect on his attitude and consciousness. Then Jonah left the city and stopped outside to rest and wait to see what happens to the city. God provides a board to shelter him from the hot sun. Jonah was happy with the shade provided by the gourd's vines, but the next day, God provides a worm that eats the vine, making it wither. 
Then God sends a sultry east wind, and the sun beats down upon Jonah's head, and Jonah complains again. The symbols and the situations in these verses mentioned here represent the changing attitudes in our mind resulting from uncertainty about our spiritual guidance. Here's Jonah, a successful prophet, before God calls him to prophesy in Nineveh. Jonah works diligently to hold fast to this spiritual calling, but he continues to struggle with resentment and doubt about it. In Jonah's defense, I know I have had times in my life where I resented or doubted where I ended up. These experiences can make us feel separate and isolated from the source of all good. In these times, we too can struggle to hold on to our spiritual compass. Going back to the story, God scolded Jonah for being concerned about a vine, his own comfort, but not about Nineveh. Jehovah says, you were sorry to see the plant die, though you did not make it grow, and though it came up in a night and died in the night. And should not I have pity on Nineveh, that great city where are more than a hundred thousand little children and also many cattle, all helpless and knowing nothing. By comparing Jonah's feelings about the gourd, which was a low form of life, with his lack of feeling for the Ninevites, whom Jonah's words had turned from evil to good and restored to harmony with divine love, God was teaching Jonah meekness. Emily Cady, an American homeopathic physician and author of New Thought Spiritual Writings, tells us in her book, Lessons in Truth, meekness is not weakness, nor is it an excessive willingness to serve or please others. It is spiritual strength rightly directed, that makes us receptive to our true nature as children of God. To be meek or humble is to be free from all negative reaction. Meekness is a non-resistant attitude of mind in which we feel free from fear of losing our so-called rights. It's knowing that God's will for us is good, and then conforming to it. The quality of meekness enables us to be open and be receptive to God's guidance at all times. It makes us teachable and obedient to this guidance. Without meekness, the Christ life cannot be attained. Without meekness, we slide into an internal conflict of soul that manifests itself in anger, frustration, bitterness, resentment, and turmoil. Meekness tames the temper, subdues the self, calms the passions, and brings order out of chaos in the soul. It allows us to accentuate the positive in our lives. Reverend Ed Townley, another unity minister who was known for his metaphysical interpretations of the Bible, provides these closing thoughts for today's story about Jonah. Each of us is here to achieve a given spiritual purpose, to make a unique and important contribution to the creation of the new consciousness 
that Jesus describes as the kingdom of heaven. We may live in ignorance of that purpose, or we may make choices that don't guide us in the right direction. Jonah is directed to Nineveh, but he isn't forced to go there. He's free to head off in another direction. Our own Jonah consciousness may be distracted by many diversions or may insist on finding an easier, softer way. However, choices have consequences. We may spend a lot of time suffering through storms, but there's an innate awareness represented by the sailors in the story that the underlying problem is that we're out of alignment with God, with our own spiritual purpose and power. It's only by moving deeper into the storm, by surrendering to the consequences of our choices, that we're given the opportunity to pause, take stock, and make new choices. From this metaphysical perspective, then, the great fish isn't a punishment, but a gift. It's a time apart, a time of enforced stillness and complete surrender to, to divine ideas and thoughts. Many of us, when we come to an awareness of spiritual purpose, immediately assume to be masters over that purpose. Thoughts in our own consciousness may insist that they know how it works and can predict the outworkings of spirit. But the only thing certain about the power we call God is that it is a power of love. Its purpose is always to express as love at every opportunity. We are simply to be channels of that love, co-creators with it, and not to presume that we can control or direct it. And so it is, and so we allow this to be. Get comfortable where you are. 
If you like, I invite you to close your eyes and turn your attention to your breath. Breathing in the presence of Divine Spirit and breathing out any tension or feelings of resistance. Take a few moments and feel your body relax. Rest in the stillness and allow your heart to open to the love of God that is within you and all around you. Breathe in deeply and know that you are enfolded in God's tender care. You are calm now. You are serene as you release any need there may be to know or control. You are at peace in this moment. This one moment, this holy instant, is enough to become still and know your divine purpose and oneness with divine source. Breathe into this moment. Focus on this moment. Be here now in this sacred space. Feel divine love's energy flow through you. Feel the divine comforter's presence within and around you. If painful thoughts come up, just gently acknowledge them and then return to love's embrace. If feelings of anxiety or resistance come up, allow these as well and then return to love's soft and tender embrace. God is our help in every need. You are one with the one power and presence. You are never alone. Love is contained in your very breath. You are a channel for divine love to express here and now. As we prepare to enter the silence, gently allow love to fill any seeming void. Rest in this comfort and peace. Do this now for a few moments in the silence. And now, remaining centered in the love that you are, gently allow yourself to return to this now moment, to this place. We give thanks for this time together in contemplation and for what we have learned from it. We are all one, living each day 
divinely guided to unfold our soul's desires and express greater good in our lives and in the world. And we affirm this in the name and in the power of our way sure, Jesus Christ. And so it is. And so we joyously allow this to be. Amen.
And our service will end today with Richard McDesey's song, Living Inside of You. Inside.